Dad, can I use the IBM computer tonight? If you think I'm going to let you put your grubby little mitts on my several thousand pounds worth of gear, you can just go fuck yourself. I've always thought of IBM sort of XT class machines as being these monstrous boxes like we see on this advert here, but actually they don't have to be. And I recently acquired this little baby here, which, and, and also who says that beige computers have to be big, ugly beige bricks. This thing's a sleek little beige thing. Um, and yes, this is an XT class machine and that's what we're going to be taking a look at today. What we have here is an Amstrad PC5086. Just a sweet little beige box, minimalist uh, on the front. We've just got a couple of LEDs here um, and a single drive, which is a 720K floppy and 3.5 inch. So unusual for that, this kind of machine as well. Over on the other side, still not much going on here. We've got uh, power input to the PSU, we've got a pass through for power to the monitor, a nice chunky on off switch, an external fan that sits outside the PSU, and we've got a parallel port, we've got a serial port, we've got two expansion slots, we've got a little knob which I guess is for the speaker volume, though I'm not sure, we'll find out shortly, and buried away under the fan there we've got a VGA input. And almost as if a homage to the mighty Atari ST, we have this bizarre little um, arrangement for connecting your keyboard and mouse. And at first glance, it looks like two PS2 ports, which is what I thought it was when I first saw it on eBay and bought it, but I was caught out. It is not that, indeed. There's a PS2 mouse connector, but the other one, though it looks like a PS2 keyboard connector, it's an XT keyboard, but you need to have a, a PS2 adapter, so I guess the original Amstrad keyboard came with that connector on its XT keyboard. But I think it was actually switchable on the original. And on to the most exciting element of any purchase of an old machine is let's open it up and just see how much shit, gunk, spider webs, and mouse droppings are waiting for us inside. Pleasingly clean looking, but disappointing that there's no fossilized insects from 1991 lying on the motherboard. So I couldn't find a huge amount of information about this machine. It was released in 1991. Um, digging around in my magazines from that period, I found this advert, which is the case is identical to the machine that I have, only this is actually a 386, which you'd expect people to be buying 386s in 1991, not 8086s. But yeah, if you look at this um, sales advert, this price list for Amstrad as well, you can see they, their range really does run from 8086s up to 386s and 486s in 1991. So bizarrely, you could still buy multiple generations of chip um, brand new at that time. So we can see half the motherboard, which is not covered by drives and such. So we'll take a quick look around there. The first thing we've got is our 8086 and it is an 8086, not an 8088, which means it's a, a little bit more capable. This one's an eight megahertz model made by Siemens. It's not in a socket, unfortunately, it's soldered to the board. So it'd be a bit of a pain if you wanted to try a few different versions of this chip on there. Um, so probably stuck with that Siemens 8086 on this, I think. Next to it, we've got an empty socket for 8087 maths code processor floating point unit. And then we've got some chips for the BIOS, two chips, it looks like, and it's an Amstrad BIOS. Then we've got an expansion riser that has two 8-bit ISA slots, so we can put some cards in there maybe. Down here, no barrel battery on this, which is good, which is probably partially why this thing is so immaculate inside. We've got a socketed, already socketed Dallas um, clock chip, which is good. So we can pop a new one in there um, if needs be, but this one seemed to be working when I booted it up when I first got it. Um, then we've got a Kyocera clock crystal and something down here that looks like RAM. And looking at the chips, it looks like 256K chips, but I don't think that can be right because this machine only has 640K of RAM in total. Maybe a megabyte of video RAM there, I don't know, and maybe that next to it is the 640K of system memory. There's some kind of controller here from chips, which is probably the, um, the XT controller, I would think. And 
then from that strange volume knob that we was looking at earlier, there are some cables that do seem to run over to the internal PC speaker. Pop this riser card out. It's like a single 8-bit ISO slot that basically divides it out into two by the looks of it. Um, held on by plastic screws, which is a bit bizarre. Um, not much use with my magnetic screwdriver, but there you go. And now we'll get the floppy drive out. And I have to confess, I did take a quick peek in this machine when I first got it. So this isn't actually the first time I've been in it. And um, when I first got it and fired it up after fighting with various keyboard error messages and finally figuring out that it was actually an XT keyboard I needed with a PS2 connector, I got into the system and found the floppy drive didn't work. It was making some horrible noises. So Googling around, it's a proprietary floppy drive and some of the connectors and things look very similar to the CPC range that Amstrad had, and I think they also had them in their PCW range of computer word processors, a non-standard drive, except I believe in those other machines, it's actually a three inch drive. It's a strange oblong shaped thing, but this is a standard 3.5 shape. So I figured it probably was the belt, looked inside, found this shredded piece of rubber rubbish inside and fished it out. But I thought if I get a CPC belt drive, it's probably going to be the right size. So I did that, threaded it through. Um, I had to lift the drive motor at the back to hook it under. And sure enough, that fixed it. And it's all working perfectly now. I just want to get this entire drive bay out. Um, there seems to be an Amstrad branded hard disk drive in there. And it looks like an IDE disk drive. It's a 40 megabyte drive. Um, and since I've got a drive tray, which also contains the PSU, but trying to lift it out, it's got cables that are attached underneath it to the motherboard with what look like um, sort of ID style connectors, but they don't seem to want to move. So I don't know whether those things are actually soldered on there somehow. So I prized it up, but didn't want to take it too far just in case I broke something. So really, I'm just going to try and get in there and take a couple of snapshots to get some detail of some of the chips under there so I can look them up and see what they are and I've got a vague idea of what's going on under there so um, that's enough I think rather than persevere and damage something which I probably would. It all hangs around this chips controller that we looked at before. It's an 82C100 and it's actually called a Super XT compatible controller. So it's it's a system that emulates, it actually emulates a PS2 Model 30 functionality wise and can either use an 8086 or an 8088. Uh, obviously this one's got an 8086 soldered onto it. So that is the guts of the system and it also allows for some of, some of the bits that you got on the PS2 Model 30. So what that means is the PS2 Model 30 was IBM's evolution of the PCXT and that it integrated things like gra the graphics adapter and a parallel port and just basically allowed for a lot more expansion than you would get on the normal PCXT. So when you look at the spec sheet for the PS2 Model 30 um, that IBM issued, it looks a lot like this machine. Um, 8086 processor, 8 megahertz, which is what we've got, an empty socket for an 8087, 8-bit bus, uh, it's the original Model 30 had three expansion slots, two on this machine because of its small compact format, I guess. And, and then the ports are PS2 and type for the mouse and the keyboard. Uh, it's got 640 kilobytes, which is the same as what this machine's got. Uh, the original spec for the Model 30 was for a 70 watt power supply. I'm not quite sure what this has got. I couldn't see any markings anywhere, but probably the same. And um, three and a half inch floppy drives instead of the five and a quarters, 720K. And a hard disk of 20 or 30 megabytes on the Model 30, but we've got 40 here, so that's the format this machine seems to be following. All these bits and pieces here are what goes to make up the Super XT compatible bits and pieces. So the core of it's the 82C100 that we just looked at, and then if you look at some of these other chips, that chip gets used in conjunction usually with the chips 82C601, though the chip in here seems to have a slightly different number, so maybe it's a more recent version. And then also goes with the 82C451 VGA graphics controller, which is also what we have in this machine. Okay, time to get this puppy back together and see if we can make it go. 
I do need to find a, a permanent keyboard and mouse solution for this machine. Luckily, the original mouse, the Amstrad mouse, did come with it, but it just does not work at all. So I'm going to have to try and figure out what's wrong with that, and hopefully I'll be able to continue using that. There was no keyboard with it, and um, I do have a few possible things that I could use with this machine, but I have this absolutely wrecked old um, switchable ATXT keyboard that's got broken keyboard posts and a multitude of other things, but it's a nice old sort of pseudo mechanical keyboard and I would like to use this and this will become the keyboard that goes with this machine if I can make it work and look good again. But that's for another video. In the meantime, I'll be using this little contraption that converts a standard AT to XT. So I can use any old keyboard with this and I'll be using my trusty Mitsumi mouse just for the time being. So we'll hook up the other bits and pieces that we need to fire her up and then let's just take a quick look and see what's on the hard drive out the box. Ah, Dosh Shell. It's been so long. I've missed you so much. Well, it's a bit disappointing. There isn't really much on here at all. Um, there's just some crappy games and nothing that I would want to keep and... Really not much else, a lot of empty directories by the looks of it, so we're going to go ahead and wipe all of this stuff off. So I'm going to wipe all of this, and I did manage to locate the original install disks for this machine, or machines of this era at least. And this is DOS 3.3, which is what the machine originally came with. Um, it's also the spec for the PS2 Model 30 that DOS 3 was what that came with. And so I'm going to go ahead and install this and see what it's like. And what was it like? It was actually pretty painful. It wasn't a very pleasant install experience at all. It wasn't like normal DOS. I ended up somehow with a non-DOS partition and I tried to use FDisk and FDisk couldn't remove it. And basically the system was shagged. What I found then on the disk was there's this kind of proprietary version of FDisk prefixed with the letters AMS for Amstrad, so AMPS FDisk, and running that sorted of out. So this was obviously the way that it was supposed to be done, and eventually we got the installer working and 3.3 installed correctly. So yeah, time to get it all back together and do some stuff. So time to try and put some games on this machine. And then it occurred to me that I don't really have much software that might be on 720k discs from this era. So digging around up in the games room, I came up with two possibilities. Uh, one of them was an, a fail to begin with because while it was from the right era when I opened the box, it actually had a mix. It had one disc on a 720k disc and the other two were on high density discs and that must have just been the way that it came because it was a shrink wrap box when I got it and I took it upstairs and tried to convert the files off the high density discs onto 720k discs but the file size was too big so I physically couldn't move those things off which is presumably why it was done that way in the first place. So then I have this triple pack game and when I tried to use these, these look like 720k discs but the Amstrad refused to read them. So I took those upstairs thinking the discs might be faulty but they read okay on, on my other machines so I copied those onto known working 720k discs and we'll get those installed now. That installed okay and here we've got Battletech, the Crescent Hawks Revenge. I think this is a kind of text adventure. I've been meaning to play this for a while. Um, let's see how it looks. Just give it a quick once over and make sure it's all running okay. Ah, the dulcet tones of the PC speaker. So there's immediately scope for doing something. This thing needs a sound card for sure. So yeah, 8-bit sound cards aren't that cheap these days. So we'll have to see what we can do about that. And now we move up to the retro room. So the idea up here has been gradually over the last couple of months is to try and get a range of machines permanently in place so that I've got a good range of 
eras and specifications to play with at the minute there's the tiny pentium 3 450 that's permanently there and set up now there's the gateway 486dx that i did a few modifications to in one of the other videos that's there and permanently set up now there's the olivetti pentium 200 with the 3d Voodoo FX cards that's set up there permanently now. So they're the only three machines that I've really got set up. So let's add this one on, make a bit of space for it. First thing I'm going to do is get a better keyboard rather than use a, a PS2 keyboard through the adapter. So somewhere in this big pile there is a Monterey keyboard that is also ATXT switchable. So I'm going to dig that one out and I'll just keep using the Mitsumi mouse also. There's a little corner being cleared now for it to sit in and I've dug out, I've had this TVM, I think it's a 15 inch monitor for a while, VJ monitors, not quite period correct, I think this is from 1997, but I think it'll be a nice little pairing to go with this for now and we'll use that. So there she is, sweet, sweet looking little machine, looking forward to having lots of fun with this, my first XT class machine, have a little go at this game Scryless, uh, got no freaking idea what's going on here, probably should read the instructions, but yep, it's all good, we're going to be revisiting this machine, we need to get some sound on there and, um, and sort the keyboard and mouse out, but in the meantime I hope if you watched this video you enjoyed it, and if you did you consider maybe giving it a thumbs up or subscribing, thank you very much for watching and I hope to see you on the channel again.